Well, hello everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. We'd like to welcome our distinguished guests and visitors and our guest speaker, Dr. Testale Malaku, to the 2020 Alpha Kappa Delta International Sociological Honor Society induction ceremony from West Point. My name is Major Annie Apodaca. In particular, we welcome our current and our future members of AKD. We would also like to welcome all people in the Army sociology community and friends and family. This year is special for three reasons. First, April 29th is Denim Day across the globe and at West Point. On April 29th, 2020, millions of people across the world will wear jeans or other denim with the purposes of supporting survivors and educating themselves and others about all forms of sexual violence. Please feel free to Google Denim Day to learn more. Second, we come to you virtually. This is abnormal, but actually we have quite a large audience given um, the circumstances. Finally, we are graduating our first class with cadets minoring in diversity and inclusion studies. We've invited them to join AKD given their strong interest in the sociological perspective. Not all the minors are sociology majors, so this is an opportunity to reach across the academy and disciplines. AKD at West Point is a 21st century happening. It's established in 2000 with our first induction in 2001. Our chapter is Alpha Phi of New York and the sociology program is part of the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership at West Point. AKD is a democratic and international society of scholars dedicated to the ideal of the three Greek words that translate to investigate humanity for the purpose of service. The purpose of AKD, according to its constitution, is to promote excellence in the scholarship, in the study of sociology, research of social problems, and such other social and intellectual activities as will lead to improvement of the human condition. The goal and purpose of AKD is reflected in its name, Alpha Kappa Delta, which was created by Dr. Emery S. Bogardis at the University of Southern California in 1920. Yep, AKD is 100 years old this year. Alpha Phi of New York initiates both faculty and cadets. Following the annual initiation of cadet and faculty members, invited guest speakers present research, make speeches, or give talks in their respective areas of interest. Past speakers have included renowned sociologists in their field of specialization, including, brace yourself, this is a long list, Randall Collins, Mady Siegel, Jeffrey Alexander, Cecilia Ridgway, David Siegel, Brenda Moore, John Steiner, Jim Burke, Donna Gaines, Pamela Stone, Irving Smith, Eduardo Bonilla Silva, Richard Oseo, and Darcy Schnack. Among others, including our first speaker in 2001, Professor Emeritus Bruce, Bruce Keith, who I believe is joining us from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia right now. Professor Ender has the highest praises for the yearly ceremony saying, Alpha Kappa Delta gives a sociology program at West Point an opportunity to raise the talent of our faculty and students while allowing us to bring in guest speakers to lecture on topics relevant to cadets and sociology. Every year we have a wonderful time. We celebrate academic achievement, we learn something new, and we generate interest in sociology among cadets, staff, and faculty outside of the department. And sometimes we get to eat cake. <laughs> Not this year. <laughs> By the way, Dr. Ender checked in with the AKD home office in Le Moyne College in Ithaca, and we learned that we're actually only one of six ceremonies being held out of the normal hundreds that are held every spring semester across the United States. So we're pretty proud of that. Again, beginning the AKD back in 1920 at the University of Southern California, while the chair of the department, Dr. Bogardis, proposed to the graduate students that they form a society where the students become acquainted with each other's research and where they can meet informally with the faculty and staff for suggestions and criticisms. Today, with thousands of members and over 440 chapters throughout the world, AKD is truly an international sociological honor society. AKD is 100 years old, and we are 20 years old with this initiation ceremony. Our chapter, Alpha Phi of New York, has inducted 103 faculty, staff, and cadets into our chapter, and today we're going to add 11 more. This is our largest inducted class in 20 years, a class that joins the long teal line. Now I'm going to hand it over to Major Absalon. 
Hello, my name is uh, Major Jake Absalom. Uh, when I call your name, cadets, and Brian, uh, please video in, uh, turn on your mic, and feel free to say a few words. You can have your people uh, in the background if they're there with you as well. Uh, we'll Annie, we'll take a screenshot of you as you're speaking, um, and then we'll take a group photo towards the end of the session. So our first two awardees are unable to be with us today, um, but Emerson Brbieska, class of 2021, and Brandy Nichelle Braggs, class of 2021. Our first cadet president is Stephanie Marie Druggen from class of 2021. Stephanie, you there? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for showing up today, for doing this for us, even though I know it's not the ideal circumstances, but um, it's my minor, but it means a lot to me to be a part of the department, uh, even if it is just my minor. And I want to, once again, just thank you guys for showing up and um, helping support us, even though this is a big accomplishment, I feel like, and uh, I'm glad to be a part of the long teal line. <laughs> nice. Raven Olivia Hudspin. Hi everyone, I don't really have much to say other than thank you and I appreciate everything that you've done. Olivia Violet Johnson. Hey, I just wanna also say thank you and the sociology department's been really great. So I'm really proud to be a part of this um, society and just the major in general. Andrea Jane Carlin. everybody um i just want to say thank you um to the professor for putting this together um it's been awesome being part of sociology and i switched into it and also the diversity minor is just great um so thank you guys koi simone kizzy hi everyone um i just want to say thank you for the opportunity Anyone who knows me knows the sociology department is my favorite place on West Point and the diversity minor was such um, an awesome thing I got to do as a cadet. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Alexander Minsu Yang. Alex, you there? He was early. We'll come back. Claire Mia Dano Yane. Hi, everybody. I just want to say thank you as well, and I appreciate the opportunity and the the ceremony. So that's all I got. <laughs> Miranda Sophie Williams. <clears throat> Hi, I just wanted to thank everyone um, for making this possible. Um, I've loved being a sociology major, and I really appreciate all the support throughout the last four years. So thank you. Captain Promotable, Brian Michael Williams. Michael. It's Matthew, but no worries. Uh, I get him, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, just say Say thanks to uh, sociology team. Uh, glad to be a part of it. Looking forward to two more years uh, with the team here. And just also uh, excited to see that West Point's trailblazing, leading the way, all things AKD being one of six uh, you know, places holding this ceremony. Glad to see us uh, adapt during these times. So thank you. Alex, you out there on the net? Yes, sir. Can everyone hear and see me? We can. Wonderful. I just wanted to thank everyone um, for coming to this um, ceremony. It really means a lot to me. I'm very grateful for everyone, including the sociology department. And I'm very excited to see what the future has in store for me, as well as the sociology department itself. Thanks, Alex. Please join us in a round of applause for our 2020 honorees. I will be followed by Professor Morton-Hinder. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I am the acting sociology program director during Colonel Hajar's uh, sabbatical leave. 
Um, so this year, we've got a little bit of extra time uh, than our usual one hour at West Point. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the state of the sociology program before I introduce our guest speaker. So uh, as always, bottom line up front, Army sociology is more than thriving. We could not even imagine where we uh, would be at uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we've always thought of ourselves as this small, intimate program with a personal touch, but uh, you know, we've always worked directly with all our cadets at a roughly three to one cadet uh, to faculty ratio. Even better than West Point's seven to one ratio. But the program has grown beyond even our wildest uh, expectations. Ever since uh, the advent of plebes being able to declare their major in the spring of their uh, uh, plebe year and then taking intro already at yearlings, the quantity of cadets has grown dramatically. Uh, we are regularly uh, with over 100 cadets in the program. That's a 25 to 1 cadet to faculty ratio. Uh, at this moment, we have 113 cadets in the program, and that's a record number. Uh, in addition to taking uh, classes earlier in the program, uh, cadets can now go deeper and stay longer in the major, and this has paid off tremendously. So the quality of what uh, cadets know and what they can do with the major is pretty substantial. Um, this year we'll be graduating 27 firsties. This is the largest uh, Army sociology graduating class. Two of those uh, firsties are minoring in Latin American regional studies and five are minoring in diversity and inclusion studies, uh, which is, by the way, the first class to graduate in this new minor. And also, by the way, in case you didn't know, we do indeed have, a for, for those of you around the world, uh, and I know there are literally people from around the world on here, I've seen Poland, Greece, and Denmark uh, represented so far. Uh, we have a new diversity and inclusion studies minor. Uh, We've partnered with the departments of English and history, and we're currently administrating the minor here in BSNL as an interdisciplinary affair. Uh, and the minor's doing really well. As you see, uh, seven of the inductees today are in the minor. In terms of our faculty, uh, we'll be saying goodbye to Major uh, Annie Apodaca this summer. She's headed off to Germany with her family. Major Absalon and Naomi are headed to Fort Bliss, Texas this summer. Major Dawson remains with us uh, in an adjunct capacity from the Army Cyber Institute across campus. And of course, Colonel Hajar will return from his sabbatical leave this fall. You saw Captain Promotable Brian Matthew Williams. Uh, he's in his first year and uh, he's been a quick study and he'll be advising cadets and he'll be moving into the Army sociology area this summer and serving as, a, as our XO. So that's all exciting stuff. Uh, we have the very capable Lieutenant Colonel Katie Matthew and Captains Gabby Perez, Alex Picardo, Nicholas Rich, and Stephen Mota all in the graduate school pipeline readying themselves for the, for the program. So really, there you have it. Um, Cadets, faculty, the programs uh, comprising this little shining beacon on the hill of the, Ruts, uh, of the Hudson River, teeming with trip sections, conferences, and relevant courses and course-related activities. So that's the state of the program. So you heard that wonderful group of uh, faculty that have come to speak during uh, the AKD ceremony, and um, no less this year we have a, a terrific speaker. Dr. Tizdale Milaku is a sociologist and a critical race and gender scholar. She is a visiting assistant professor and postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Research on the African Diaspora in the Americans and the Caribbean as part of the Graduate School and University Center of the City University of New York. She has a BA in sociology and Africana studies with a minor in psychology from NYU. She later earned an MA in sociology from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She earned her doctoral dissertation in 2016 in sociology from the Graduate Center at the C City University of New York, uh, where she focused uh, her dissertation on race and gender issues. 
Her current scholarship focus on race, class, and gender and diversity in the workplace. She's published articles in the Harvard Business Review and Racism Review, among other respected journals. Her public sociology uh, includes talks at the New York Public Library, the Social Science Research Council, the New York Times, and even NBC's The Today Show. Her current research pro uh, projects include studies of anti-lynching in the late 19th and early 20th century, and black women and, and hair politics. Her talk today is based on her recent book uh, titled, You Don't Look Like a Lawyer, Black Women and Systemic Gender Racism, published last year by uh, Roman and Littlefield. A little shout out on the, on the book. Um, she's a soccer fan, uh, go NYC FC, and like me, uh, we're missing live New York soccer games this spring. Hopefully we'll get some this summer. Um, Tisdale is coming to us from everyone's favorite city, New York City, where she lives in a home full of boys, uh, her husband uh, and two sons. So with that, we'll have a little transition here. I'll turn it over to Tisdale. Thank you so much, Senator. I am so honored to be here today to share my work with you. Um, what I really would love to do is congratulate everyone here today, um, in, in particular the inductees and the uh, students who are graduating with the diversity and inclusion minor, which is so appropriate for my talk today. I hope um, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope that you'll be able to have some um, good questions for me and we can have a little bit of a dialogue afterwards. I'm gonna try to stick to my time here so that we can have more discussion following. Okay, so this presentation today is You Don't Look Like a Lawyer and it comes out of my larger research where I examine how race and gender uh, impact advancement uh, for black female lawyers in elite corporate law firms. I'll discuss how systemic gendered racism is deeply embedded in professional appearance and how it influences the perception of black female lawyers abilities, thus impacting their prospects for advancement. Um, this research, I really believe is timely because we see how women lawyers are being celebrated today. And if you see here, um, you know, from, the, from New York Magazine, Super Lawyers and the New York Times, Black women continue to be severely underrepresented and barely identifiable in these um, publications. So my observation is reflective of the research findings in terms of looking at Black women in um, corporate firms. So a little over a year ago, the New York Times ran a front page article about diversity and inclusion in elite law firms. In the legal field in general, a very popular refrain has been parried towards women and people of color, and that is you don't look like a lawyer. It's the idea that success, ability, and competence look a certain way, very white and male. And judging from this image here, it was clearly reflected in the new partnership class um, announcement of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. All but one of the new partners very much look the part, white and male. And a funny story just to add on top of that, the firm um, came out and said that this is actually a very diverse group of individuals um, with 25% representing gender diversity, 25% representing LGBTQ, and 25% representing a Latinx identity. Um, and I particularly find that troubling and I focus on how, you know, diversity needs to really be defined in terms of what we're missing primarily in these organizations. And if we just look at this image right here, I focus on racial diversity. So instead of talking about diversity um, as meaning anything and everything, focusing on where we lack in these organizations will bring us forward in terms of how we can make some substantive changes. So you know, the you don't look like mentality is a microaggression hardly specific to the legal industry or the institutions. This term is used freely in many industries, including, you know, I'm sure you've heard you don't look like a doctor, a CEO, a congressperson, a scientist, or a professor. You know, I've heard this quite often in my classrooms from my own students, faculty, and staff. So it's not something that is just happening in law firms, um, which is important to consider. 
So more than any other group, perhaps, the legal judgment of attorneys of color is inextricably tied to their appearance. The more ethnic they appear, the less capable they are perceived by their colleagues. Consequently, pressure to conform to dominant Eurocentric aesthetics is high and demanding. It's a loaded issue that female lawyers of African descent confront daily in firms, as well as in many other corporate and even non-corporate settings. Elite law firms are typically white institutional spaces, traditionally only accessible to white men. So today, this space continues to be predominantly white and male, with white associates and partners comprising approximately 84% of the total U.S. lawyer demographic. Um, and of this population, white partners constitute 90.79% of all partners. So associates of color are drastically underrepresented in firms, which leads quite logically to their underrepresentation in partnership positions. So fewer black female associates are recruited, yet attrition remains highest among black associates, decreasing the number of black female lawyers in law firms overall, while further diminishing the pool of potential partners. So this evidence has clearly shown that the path to partnership is curtailed for this demographic, essentially preventing its professional development, limiting its advancement opportunities, and thus leading to high attrition rates. And I'll give you some examples here. Um, there have been previous studies on law lawyers of color in corporate firms, and they have investigated the subconscious stereotypes and biases that proliferate in these environments. They also look at the culture of work within firms that dictates the schemata of mentoring opportunities, which is key for advancement, as well as various generalizing themes which lump racially subordinated associates together rather than assessing individual merit. So such empirical uh, research provides a critical understanding of the conventional arguments used by firms to justify the small number of black and its impact on partnership acquisition. Further adding to the complexity of the experience of black women in these firms is the research on gender barriers to advancement. And these assert that women face much tougher obstacles with overall visibility, developing sponsor relationships, more critical than mentor relationships, becoming rainmakers, accessing informal and formal networking opportunities, in addition to encountering even greater implicit prejudices subtle in nature. So other factors indicated by prominent studies demonstrate that high attrition rates among women of color in corporate environments can be attributed to the lack of substantive billable work, the, the hours and the type of work that they're doing in firms, effective diversity measures, proper training, work-life balance, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard including, and the lack of um, the lack of sentiment that they're uh, work that the work that they perform is actually valued, which is really critical. So these factors combine support and explain recent vault and minority corporate counsel, um, the 2018 and the 2019 law firm diversity survey data, which indicates that U.S. female lawyers of African descent have the highest attrition rates across all racial and gender groups. So you'll see here in 2018, black women were at the highest attrition rate at 14.7. Here in 2019, they're jumped up to 17.3%. You notice that this is a 2.6% increase, which clearly um, goes along with the ideas that there are substantive barriers that black women encounter in firms that lead to them leaving at much higher diversity in the top law firms, which represents the population in my study, we find that black female lawyers are significantly underrepresented. And to illustrate that, when I was conducting my study, the National Association of Legal Professionals um, Directory of Employers only had 17 black female partners within the top 23 law firms that provided demographics based on race, gender, and position. And as you can see here, um, the stark difference of women partners in comparison to male partners there's still significant barriers preventing their advancement. And this has been more pronounced for black female lawyers who only make up approximately 3.7% of female partners um, and only 0.7% of the total partners. Um, it's very interesting to think about this as we you know, look to understand what are some of the reasons that lead to these very low numbers. If you continue to look, although the gender gap seems to be narrower at non-partner ranks, 
Black female lawyers across the board are significantly underrepresented in all other categories. And I will say that this is not to say that Black men and Latinx lawyers fare any better, but my research focuses particularly on Black women. I center them in this work. So, you know, building on existing research on issues concerning race and gender in the legal field, my research assumes that the absence of Black women corporate partners, however normalized within elite corporate firm culture, is a social problem that is really worthy of exploration. And so the inquiry I had, I started with was, why are there still so few Black female partners? And to address this question, I focus on the perceptions and experiences of Black female lawyers, particularly with respect to how race and gender affect their career trajectories. I interviewed 20 Black female lawyers, um, and the data that I'm going to be presenting comes out of those interviews. What I use is, in terms of my frame, is an intersectional approach to understanding how race and gender combine and or intersect, overlap, um, to create unique experiences for Black female lawyers. So the common thread within various ways of looking at intersectional and intersectionality theory is that it suggests examining numerous categories, whether it's social, biological, or cultural, like race, gender, sexual orientation, class, ability, and other axes of identity that interact on multiple and often simultaneous levels, thereby contributing to systemic social inequality. So the interconnectedness of these various identities creates um, experiences that produce oppressive and disadvantageous outcomes for Black female lawyers. You know, my theoretical frame was um, really grounded in uh, analyzing race and racism um, and how that would impact Black female lawyers and the challenges that they face. What's clear for me is that systemic racism, white racial framing, colorblind racist ideology um, all create circumstances the salience of race and gender, creating a system of oppression that reflects the intersection of multiple forms of discrimination in these particular spaces. I draw on critical race uh, scholarship in particular and that of Joe Fagan's theory of systemic racism, which essentially argues that it's entrenched in American institutions and provides insight on how whites are privileged over subordinated racial groups. And then building on that through his concept of the white racial frame, which is essentially a dominant white perspective that only sees things from a white point of view, ignoring perspectives and views of people forcing white privilege and power. And then through that, maintaining racial inequality and inequality in um, white institutional spaces. So this frame essentially breaks consciously or unconsciously racialized narratives, stereotypes, ideologies that posit whites as superior to people of color. And I will say here that oftentimes the white racial frame is um, also bought into by people of color. So that's something important to keep in mind. Um, I also draw on Adia Harvey Wingfield's concept of systemic gender racism, which argues that the white racial frame um, that rationalizes systemic discrimination is also gendered. So that essentially means that there is an inseparable linkage um, of race and gender, which leads to differentiated outcomes. Thus, Black female lawyers in my study experience racial and gendered oppression in ways that are unique to their social location. Um, like I said, I conducted semi-structured, in-depth, anonymous interviews with 20 Black female lawyers from within the top 25 corporate law firms um, and included various questions that focused on recruitment, professional development, and obstacles to advancement. For this presentation today, I'm going to particularly focus on appearance, fitting in, and mistaken identities, which is reflective of most work environments um, and may certainly resonate with some of you today. So... In discussing corporate aesthetics, it's important to actually acknowledge that white institutional spaces adhere to Eurocentric beauty standards, which out of hand exclude many women of color and particularly black women. So as is known, a European beauty standard affirms the belief that European features are universally more appealing and desirable. Attributes linked to whiteness, such as light skin, thin nose, thin lips, straight hair, uh, and light colored eyes are viewed as beautiful as opposed to features that contrast or complicate these standards. 
So derived directly from this predominant white racial frame of beauty, black women are viewed as inferior to white women with particular markers such as hair, right? Triggering this toxic conception of racial inferiority and often enough, the lack of femininity. And we know that there's a lot of research right now that focuses on hair and race and what that implies in spaces, whether it's professional spaces, personal spaces, spaces in general that, um, that use hair as a racial marker. So, you know, assessing what an ideal candidate, which is one of the things that I needed to do in my study, would, um, what an ideal candidate would need in order to gain entry to an elite firm, all of the participants acknowledged that a standardized checklist existed with objective criteria, and I want to say objective in quotes, um, that's utilized by the firm to gauge the fit, again in quotes, uh, of a potential candidate. So the language used here is significant, and I really want you to think about this. So the concept of fitness, fitting in or being a good fit, right, those, those words in particular are, of course, determinations based on subjective narratives of the interviewer. Add then is a form of the neutrality and or objectivity within a colorblind racist ideology that imposes a white racial frame inherently disadvantaging people of color in white institutional spaces. So the use of language to sanitize the dirty work of excluding subordinated racial groups is reflected in the terminology law firms use in their recruiting practices. Um, fitting in or being a good fit are frequently enough racially coded phrases used to neutralize racist notions of who can occupy white spaces. I heard that you uh, mentioned Eduardo Bonilla Silva was one of your speakers previously. These ideas and theories come directly out of his incredible work. Anna is the first, a fifth year associate who describes how the image of a lawyer is shaped by the white racial frame, operating to maintain the white status. So I'm gonna read it out to you. I think that there's still enough of a thought that a lawyer looks a certain way. So when you say, what are the ideal characteristics? I mean, they've just got to look like a lawyer, act like a lawyer, sound like a lawyer. Law school is supposed to teach you to think like a lawyer. What's interesting is we're in a place where culturally people think lawyers who know, you know, the Apple commercials where they got the guy who plays the Mac and the guy who plays the PC. We have concepts of what things look like to us and we fill that concept. That's why the human resources and diversity officer is a black woman. We have things, we think things, we conceptualize things. So there are a lot of smart people. There are a lot of good people. I think the thing that stands out is when you speak, someone else is willing to listen because otherwise they don't really know what you're capable of. So how comfortable with you because you fit an image of what they actually think works. So Hannah suggests conforming to an image of what already exists takes added labor measured out in emotional, mental, cognitive, uh, and physical energy expended. I argue that the terms of employment for women and people and professionals of color uh, often include what I call an invisible labor clause. That is, they are required to perform added, unacknowledged, and uncompensated labor. Moreover, they're forced to pay what I refer to as an inclusion tax, levied in the form of additional resources spent, right? So the tax includes time, money, emotional, um, cognitive energy spent to either bridge the gap, maintain, and excel in traditional white institutional spaces. The cost of inclusion for black and brown women, for instance, includes, these are examples, the hours at the hair salon or the need to custom tailor clothing, to conform to European standards of beauty, purchasing makeup, the usage of makeup, Adding to this already cumbersome load is the emotional and mental burden that goes with that. So Hannah's example depicts how the inclusion tax is levied particularly um, in terms of time, money, emotional and mental energy spent trying to conform to accepted images of whiteness, which is costly to women of color and black women in particular. So one of the biggest barriers she encountered at the firm we discussed was the perception that she did not fit, again in quotes, into the role of a lawyer based on her appearance. Like many professionals of color across industries, so finance to technology, law, medicine, and the academy, uh, Hannah experiences a debilitating apprehension 
we as people of color do not look the part of the typical lawyer or doctor because we are socially conditioned to view individuals in high prestige occupations as white. And as sociologists, I know you'll understand where this is coming from. So regardless of how hard Hannah worked, how great the quality of her work happened to be, or what she received from respected clients, it was her conviction that she failed to be viewed as a legitimate attorney. And to receive that distinction, it was necessary to do more than conform to corporate aesthetics, which in the end did not seem to be possible for her uh, in order to accomplish. So in Hannah's case, as in many, systemic gendered racism continuously worked to undermine her material successes, perceived capabilities in the eyes of white partners in the firm, who are those who are in positions of power to elevate associates into um, positions of power. So she could not be anything but herself, of course, which is a black female lawyer, which conflicted directly with the white racial framing of what a competent lawyer looked like, should and could in fact be. So that's one of the issues that um, uh, I confronted. Another is the question of comfort and how it lingers provocatively behind issues of assimilation to existing firm culture and cultural practice. As mentioned previously, the concept of fitting in itself a lexical construct of the white racial frame determines the mechanics of recruitment, professional development, and advancement. Again, with respect to the hiring process, the drama of recruitment is fairly simple. It feeds off of the, the performer audience dynamic. So along with submitting one, one's academic or experiential qualifications, the interviewee performs the assumed role of compatible candidate, which is intended to give an indication of how she will perform in a given position if hired and as an actor within the firm's existing culture. So the goal of the interviewee is to present herself as someone that can easily fit into this mold. Associates of color, particularly black females, may, they, may therefore find the interview process difficult because fitting in is often confused with sameness or likeness. So colorblind racist ideology, again, thinking about Bonilla Silva, his naturalization frame, it helps us to understand how this notion of sameness is used to accommodate subtle discriminatory practices with such law firms. So the experiences of black female lawyers and how their accounts reflect the subtle dynamics of the recruitment process in firms facilitate how we actually understand the interaction of race and gender early on in one's career. So stereotypes can and do, and we know this, whether positive or negatively, significantly impact how an individual is perceived without even necessitating a tangible or uh, sustained interaction. So here, the concept of fitting in at the firm might actually be interpreted as, can this candidate fit into the existing white cultural frame without disrupting it? So several participants in my study expressed the conviction that the recruitment process is specifically geared towards hiring particular types of people, suggesting that the so-called objective criteria you know, for hiring um, does not actually exist, right? However, contrary to their policy, this replaces the importance of subjective individual impression. I th and this is Hannah, again, our fifth year associate saying, I think that people get a feeling. It's about the trust thing. Somebody decides that they think that you're smart and somebody decides that they think that they'd like to work with you. And somebody decides that they think that there's a niche that you fit that they need to fill. A white male with contacts, a white male with a deep Rolodex and a family connection or background. That's all it is. As in any relationship, trust figures prominently into the development of connections at elite firms. Hannah goes on to explain that this is reflected in the recruitment process by the fact that interviewers tend to have more trust and confidence in those who meet the traditional, also known as hegemonic cultural image of a lawyer, which are white males like them, and are thus able to maintain group privilege in relation to others seeking access to these same institutional spaces. So in the case of hiring, in other words, it's safe to say that white male candidates have an inherent advantage over black females, as well as other subordinated racial, ethnic, and gender groups. So the theme of trust falls under the rubric of emotions and narratives that hold concrete benefits for whites, privilege within that frame. 
So regardless of merit, this trust comfort mechanism developed through a history of domination rationalizes social structures that subordinate people of color in ways that are so subtle we may not even consider them racially motivated. And that's why Hannah, among others, describes their influence as cultural programming. So just thinking about that programming, both conscious and subconscious in nature, not only operates to obscure opportunities for black female candidates to attempt the uphill battle of assimilation, but as we will see, also has a propensity to lock them into an outrageous systemic gendered um, struggle for acknowledgement. Once they even reach the current position, um, it, and it implies that this is something that they have to navigate through that recruitment effort. So the presumption of, of the white racial frame and its concepts uh, and its precepts that accidentally relegates professionals of color and black um, professionals specifically to subordinate positions within elite organizations serves as another quietly racist means for asserting the dominance of the white male superstructure. How female lawyers are culturally and socially depicted in the environs of firms directly connotes the ways in which people of color are excluded from professional development by being forced to relentlessly assert the achievements they have already made, um, let alone their eligibility for um, contacts leading to advancement. So that extra work is labor uncompensated and unrecognized. So the way one ability to adapt to existing firm culture and obtain a visible status, there are constantly um, of psychological warfare. So pervasive cultural perceptions uh, about what a lawyer looks like, right, aligns with the cultural emphasis on difference that reinforces the inviolability of the biases propping up the elite white male dominant system. So you know, these incidents pressure the participants to maintain an uber professional presentation at all times, not only to avoid these awkward interactions, but to preserve their own sense and perceived value to the firm on a daily basis. So black women uh, already have to work harder to be seen as professional, which again burdens them in ways that neither their white counterparts nor superiors experience. And here, Philomena, who's a third year associate, gives us an excellent example. I was in the elevator with ex-partner and he thought I was a secretary. That happens all the time. I think it's little things like that. The head of the firm, whenever he comes here, he sits on this floor. Every time he mistakes me for a secretary, every single time. And I'm just kind of like, whatever, I'm over it. It's little things. Again, I don't think there's any maliciousness behind it. I'm sure if I made a point of being like, hi, I'm an associate in this department and giving him he remember. But I'm not going to do that because you know, when you see my white male colleague, you do not assume that he is support staff. You just don't. So as reflected by Philomena's testimony, the little things that point to systemic gendered racism burdens her with the responsibility of dispelling the blatant stereotype that blacks cannot occupy high status positions within the, you know, she says, I'm sure if I made a point of being like, hi, I'm an associate in this department and giving him my whole bio, he'd remember that is added work. While at the same time, right, this relieves the partner who, in, who issued the injury of accountability by allowing him to fall back on the cushion of colorblind racist ideology, a system which through intentional or unintentional ambiguity categorizes the perpetuation of such slights as honest mistake, mistakes, and then slyly blames the victim by burdening them, her in this case, uh, with the conviction that acknowledgement rests with never quite adequate representation of self to achieve visibility, right? Taking on the formidable challenge of confronting the white racial frames, deeply entrenched hegemonic influence on all actors. Philomena is left to do the work. Later in the interview, Philomena actually says, you get tired of feeling like you have to dress like an attorney so you don't get mistaken for a secretary. And to give you a more recent example, this just happened. Um, a Maryland legal aid attorney, Rashad James, was determined, um, uh, was detained by a Hartford County Sheriff who presumed that he was a criminal impersonating a lawyer. 
in the courtroom. <laughs> James was, in fact, the attorney representing a client who was not present in the courtroom when he was mistaken to being the alleged client, right? So this uh, attorney, James, provides proof of his identity by showing the officer his driver's license, but that did not sway the officer. He was detained. He was also the only black lawyer in the courthouse, which also adds to why experiences like this occur. So the stress and trauma of encountering these types of daily microaggressions, which I tend not to like to use the word microaggressions because it minimizes the impact of the aggression. Um, and instead, I prefer words like injuries, is reflective of the added invisible labor that goes into being in white institutional spaces. So to quickly kind of give you my major findings of the overall world, you know, I find that, you know, law firms use language to maintain systems of inclusion. The white racial frameworks to silence the experiences of black female lawyers. Black women are blamed for their own exclusion and lack of advancement. So the sense of having to take ownership of why you're not being successful. There are white narratives of affirmative action that, um, that are working to create self-doubt amongst uh, black attorneys, their accomplishments and achievements by constantly scrutinizing their presence. So they're both hyper visible when they make a mistake like any other associate would, and then they're invisible at any other point. So if they make a mistake, it's a confirmation that they weren't actually qualified to be in there. They're a diversity hire, they're an affirmative action. That dominant uh, white culture operates to normalize the white experience, excluding all other racial groups. And what I think is a really important point to consider here is the idea, the notion that intention is important in determining whether actions are racist or sexist. It do, intention does not matter when the impact is felt by the person who's being aggressed is real. So I think that's also a critical point for us to keep in mind. Um, and just to conclude here, uh, you know, there obviously there's the existence of subtle yet pervasive everyday racialized and gendered injuries that exist, right? And uh, black women's, um, you know, it's very interesting because the experiences of black female lawyers point to the existence of these very subtle injuries, right? Um, and it does uh, really push us to think of how these are indicative of race and gender discrimination. So there often pressure to conform to this dominant white culture. Um, they're mistaken for non-lawyers, so, that, you know, as a result, stereotypes and prejudices relegate Black lawyers to subordinate positions. Um, they're forced to expend a significant amount of emotional and mental labor just to navigate the firm and the discourse around their visibility. So, like, hair talk is actually race talk. Um, they have to engage in very, very careful self-presentation and impression management in order to avoid uh, stereotypes and prejudices. And I recall in ESS, uh, some students uh, who presented from West Point were, were actually this very topic, which excited me, obviously. Um, and also, you know, women of color and black women particularly, their professional appearance is absolutely linked to their perceived abilities. And it centers uh, on conforming to this Eurocentric ideals of beauty, which offhand, as I mentioned earlier, negatively impact their experiences. So I find that all of these factors significantly disadvantage women of color, black women in particular, um, as compared to their white counterparts, which then creates all of these very real concrete hurdles to their advancement. Um, and this is so, just some of the things that I use in terms of calling uh, organizations um, to action, right? I, I, I call upon all organizations to begin to have real honest and often uncomfortable uh, conversations about what diversity and inclusion actually means within their institutions. And I love that there is a diversity and inclusion minor here because this is something that, um, you know, you're going to be going out there and leading us on this. So these are very important key points to remember when you're doing that work, you know, so engage and use the growing body of literature that it, that is here that, that actually examines the effects of race and gender um, on disadvantaged groups. You know, let's try to move away from using the terms diversity and inclusion because it's a catchphrase. It's a buzzword. There doesn't seem to be any real substantive changes that go in terms of organizations when they're using those words. They have a web page that shows all the diversity um, uh, in, within their organization. And for me, if you have a web page that is basically telling people what diversity is 
for them, it's probably because they don't have a lot of diverse people in there. Um, diversity and inclusion must not be additive. It's got to be intrinsic, foundational to an organization in order to really exist. And given the present climate and how we have this economic downturn, we're really going to see how diversity and inclusion, um, uh, what that actually means in organizations based on the decisions that they make. Um, also, outside pressures are not enough to create substantive changes within organizations. There absolutely be a sense of res uh, social responsibility and accountability amongst the people who are at the top. So those who are in positions to make substantive changes have to feel accountable. And we have, we have to invest in building organizations that represent all of us, right? So in order to have true equity, we need to have all of us in the space and particularly in legal environments, given what they're supposed to be standing for. So that's my presentation. If you um, uh, would like to have further conversation, I'm happy. If you can't stick uh, around for it, please feel free to email me. Here are my details. And thank you again for inviting me. I'm, I feel honored to have been able to present for you all. And congratulations to all of the inductees and, of course, the graduating class. Thank you. Uh. Wow, um, that was an absolute tour de force through your through your book, and that was absolutely terrific. And I was monitoring uh, on my phone; folks were chatting offline on on the phone, and um, yeah, very impressive. So uh, we have a lot of time now for some questions. And Major Absalon put a little note in the um, in the chat area where you could. Uh, post your questions. Uh, I'll, I'll start off and the rest of you can think of some cogent questions to post there. Um, in terms of this inclusion cost, could you speak to how is it related to, is it a critical mass issue or is it simply a representation issue? So if you're talking about the inclusion tax, that's actually a concept that I've developed to yeah. break down what this labor would look like, right? So um, I'm presently theorizing the inclusion tax further, but initially, and going forward, really, the inclusion tax speaks directly to the ways in which um, women, people of color, LGBTQ plus communities, and the poor in professional settings and social uh, environments forced to expend particular types of resources in order to be included in these spaces. So that includes um, uh, a financial tax that we often have to pay, a relational tax in terms of developing relationships uh, with key stakeholders, with partners, with folks who are in positions of power to move us forward. Okay. Uh, developing those types of relationships, the type of tax it, it, um, uh, is spent, right? You all emotional tax, and particular to the women that I've interviewed, this an example of an, this emotional tax would include, you know, coming into the office. So if you get my book, you'll see that I have examples of this where there are a few women who come into the office, something happens the night before um, that's race related or that has to do with a black person in leadership and they are automatically seen as the um, as the spokesperson for all black people, right? So in this moment, they need to make a decision on how they're going to interact about a racial issue or something that could be seen as racialized. And just by having that dialogue, there is an emotional tax, right? To, to, in, in order for us to be in these particular spaces where we need to be professional, having to negotiate the way that we talk about things that are so sensitive like race is very um, taxing in various ways, but it's critical to the way that the organization actually um, is able to uh, manifest and engage with their employees. So another example would be coming in and having a different hairstyle. So for example, yesterday you saw me with braids all the way back, right? Today my hair is out. If I were, and this has happened to me many times, I've worked in a firm, I would come in and my hair is one way yesterday and a different way today. And immediately it's like, Oh my goodness, I didn't know your hair could do that. What else can it do? Oh my gosh, your hair is long today and it was short yesterday. So those types of conversations are really unnecessary um, because you're, it, it triggers 
this sense of like racial difference, um, which oftentimes people don't actually have the language to speak about that. And I'm not saying, you know, don't talk about things like that. I'm saying learn how to speak about it so that it doesn't or that it doesn't create such a tax on the folks who are having to engage with you on it. Um, so that's some of the ways that the inclusion tax operates. Um, and there's a cognitive tax, obviously, you know, the mental tax in terms of my research in particular, I'll give you an example. So some of the associates that I've spoken to argued that, you know, there were soft skills that they were not privy to because they don't have relationships with particular partners, right, who are able to walk them in various steps of navigating law firm culture. And so, you know, they missed out on critical things that actually have substantive negative effects on their ability to advance. So in terms of, for example, getting billable work, they may receive work that is oftentimes raw assignments um, and sometimes uh, doing whatever work that they're doing if they're on a particular transactional deal, um, you know, they bill their time based on the, 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 you know, down to the minute, right, to the second. That's how the billable structure works in law firms. You're billing your time. That's how they make money. So, you know, they're billing while they're in the office doing the work. This is what they've learned. This is what they know. Meanwhile, white associates oftentimes are billing all times of the day. So if you're at the gym and you're running and you're thinking about a transaction and ways to work through it, that's time that they can actually bill while they're working out, which is not work time, right? but it actually is work time. So having that kind of know-how is one of the critical ways of advancing in firms. And a lot of the women I spoke to would say, I didn't know I could do that, you know? I mean, you learn it and you pick up, but coming out of um, various backgrounds, you come into this very wide space and realize that there are a lot of things happening underneath the surface that you're actually not privy to. To answer parts of that question. <laughs> No. Okay. Terrific. Great. L let me take this question. One question from Stephanie. Um, if I can find it again, it's pretty cool. She says, uh, ma'am, uh, many cadets do view diversity and inclusion as bud buzzwords and don't really have an appreciation for their application or meaning. In your experience, and I would assume in your education as well, what's an effective way to introduce these topics to people who may not be receptive to conversations about inclusivity? That is a very, that's an excellent question. Who is that, Stephanie? Thank you for that question, Stephanie. Um, this is the biggest problem that I think diversity research, diversity work, actual practicing diversity in spaces have. This is, this is the problem we have. The moment I come into a firm and start to talk, whether it's about the book or, you know, ways to improve the way that they're having conversations around diversity, I immediately get pushback, right? Me to uh, an, a room full of associates of color, that doesn't really make sense, right? Or people of color, that it's good for them to hear it, but it's also as though I'm preaching to the choir because oftentimes they have experienced the very things that I'm talking about. The problem I've encountered is having this dialogue with those who are in positions of power. Now, if you're inviting me to come and speak about this, given that this is my research, then you have to be somewhat open to having an uncomfortable conversation because I am not here to make anyone feel good about themselves, right? I'm literally here to tell you what, you know, qualitative research says about the experiences of people of color in this particular space. And although I focus on black women, this, you, you know, across the line, associates of color are experiencing this, right? And this is not just in law firms, it's in various other organizations. So my advice to you is, the first thing you have to do is just say, are you ready to have an uncomfortable conversation about the numbers? The fact that reality speaks volumes for, you know, for itself. I don't have to tell you that there aren't enough folks who are diverse in this room because all you have to do is look around. And that is a very powerful thing to start with. Oftentimes, like I said earlier, organizations, they will promote their diverse people and you know, Paul Weiss, for example, 
right after that article came out, and you can go and check it out because you'll find it easily on the web, they immediately paraded the five or six black people in that entire firm in the New York office. And it was it was painful to watch, right? Because these are folks who have somehow been able to navigate that space and automatically they are now in a position of representing an organization that is not doing right by them and by other attorneys of color or people of color in general. And the burden, the tax that goes into having to do that is incredible, right? Um, I, I had people contact me from that very article saying, yes, this is exactly what I've been talking about. I don't understand why no one you know, is trying to push it forward. Meanwhile, these organizations will have, I can't even tell you how many different diversity workshops and two point bias 2.0 and gender bias this and race this. You have all of these workshops, you're doing all of these programming, but numbers are actually going down. That doesn't make any sense. So there is a breakdown. There's something happening within these law firms that part partners are not paying attention to or are not interested in really finding out why it's happening. I'll give you another example. Coloma Cardwell, he's an attorney, a former attorney at Davis Polk who filed a, a verified complaint against the firm for racial discrimination. If you want, you should absolutely read this complaint, email me, I will send it to you. And this to me is the perfect example of what I'm talking about, what I'm writing about, the research that I'm doing, because this is someone who actually before going into the firm, made a conscious effort to interview the firm. Like, why would you want me? There's barely anyone like me here. You know, I don't see my trajectory uh, going to the top because I don't see anyone or not very many people who look like me there. So there's a breakdown in your opportunities, right? There's a breakdown in your ability to give folks who look like me access. So why would I take a chance on you? And in this complaint, he literally walks you through everything he does. And what he does that most people actually don't do is he documents every experience and continuously says, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing something racialized. I'm going to go to the people who are in a position of power to address it. And he does that eight times. And every single time he does that, he's met with pushback. He's ignored. And at the end of the day, he ends up being pushed out. And then he sues the firm and sues the firm for racial discrimination. And their response is to argue that there was no such thing that occurs, but he has documentation. And that, that's how you're able to see how racism in these spaces is so subtle, right? And it's so pernicious that oftentimes it's difficult for people to be able to say, well, you know, this person called me the N-word. Like that's an obvious form of racism, right? You can say, oh, there it is, got you. Whereas if you're constantly um, um, uninvited or not invited to events that would allow you to develop your relationships with clients and partners, there is a subtle form of exclusion there. That's, that's an obvious form of exclusion, but there's a subtle form of company that is not allowing you to gain access to the very same access that many other folks, you know, have in order to reach the top. And those folks tend to be white. So what's the difference? So when you want to talk about diversity and inclusion with folks who are in positions of power, the first thing you have to say is, are you ready to have an uncomfortable conversation? And from there, oftentimes folks will acknowledge, yes, you know, I'm ready. People are afraid of being called, of, of being called a racist. That's the problem. But if you're, if you're thinking about that so much, why? If you know the things that you're doing are not at all racist, or you don't understand whether they're racist, why not just ask a question? You know, the easiest thing you can do is just ask a question. And there are many people like me who will oblige and respond, you know? So I hope that answers the question. Okay, so no, that's great. So let's flip this. Uh, there's a, another good question here, I think that has a, a thumbs up um, and it flips the switch on um, the, the the hegemonic dimension of the of the organization. So Dr. Fry asks, um, first off, he says, uh, fantastic talk. Um, how do you effectively convince white male dominated organizations like West Point, which value assimilation and standardization 
and then ostracize difference, how do you convince them to give up power and become more inclusive? Uh, is that the end of the question? Yeah, inclusive. Did I? Yeah. Yeah, more inclusive. Yeah, sorry. I'm playing with my cursor. So how do you convince the people in power to give up some of that power or at least share some of that power and become more inclusive? I mean, I mean, I think the most important thing is to bring them to the table. If they are willing to have this conversation, then they realize and understand that there's a problem here, right? And when we're talking about, you know, white male dominated organizations, that's every, I mean, that's practically every organization, you know, that I study is white male dominated. The institution I work for, white male dominated. Um, my, just school and everything. So when you have a system that is constantly benefiting one over the other, the question is, are folks able to sit down and recognize the privilege that they have and how that privilege is actually creating disadvantage for others, right? Um, and that's a very hard thing to do. I have very folks who are close to me in positions of power, white men who see me and are, this is great work, I, I'm accepted, I'm, I'm just so excited about it. And when I question their privilege, it's like, well, wait a minute, hold up. You know, you getting access means you're gonna take away my access? And that right there is the problem. Folks are concerned about keeping what they already have in order to maintain the system that exists, which, you know, disadvantages most other folks. And in order to go into white male dominated organizations like West Point and talk about uh, standardization or, you know, ostracizing difference, we need to sit down and start with, do you see that there is a problem, right? How are you defining particular things? Why not talk to the folks, you know, who are in these positions of leadership to try to figure out how, how, how do you become more innovative? How do you become more critical of things? It's, it all starts by having uncomfortable conversations about the fact that we are in positions of power and constantly um, uh, benefiting from uh, privileges that most people don't have access to. And you need to be able to give up that privilege. Give up some of the privilege. There's plenty to go around, right? Um, you want to be able to give people an opportunity to develop, to grow, to lead. If you're looking at your cadets right now, I have seen the West Point cadets. What? That's why I was so excited when Dr. Ender invited me. I was like, I, I want to be there. I want to see everyone's face. I want to see you in uniform. But I also want to talk to you. I, wanna, I want to see what I saw at ESS when, when your students presented and how passionate they were about addressing very real systemic racial issues within the military. And how can they do that, you know, if they don't see leadership that's willing to listen to them? Um, and, and so for me, folks, be talking exactly about this, about how uncomfortable you may feel about your privilege, you know, rather than thinking about things in terms of equality, start thinking about them in terms of equity, right? You want to give people access to resources, and, you know, have an opportunity to advance, right? To become versus, you know, it's just equality, equality, equality. It's equity. We want equity. I hope that answers parts of that question. There's more, more to be thought about when you think about being a yeah, no, I, I think you certainly got there. Now, now sort of um, um, getting back to this idea, you, you said diversity and inclusion is sort of a buzzword. So, so Dr. Tony McGowan asks, uh, if diversity and inclusion are euphemistic, what might be an alternative title for our minor <laughs> and why? <laughs> um, okay, so I, don't, <laughs> I love that you have this minor. I just found out about it yesterday. This is fantastic important area of research that really needs to be developed. Um, I actually have a book coming out that looks at this particular, it's an academic handbook, so I'll tell you all about it, Courtney. Um, oh. But in terms of oh. another term, how about racial equity? <laughs> you know, for me, the research that I do in firms, I really need to focus on racial and gender equity, 
right? So if we're talking about racial and gender equity, we're very particular about the fact that in a firm where you have out of 45,000 partners nationwide, you only have 200 black female partners. That's disgusting. So when you actually say that, when you understand that you have organizations that um, pride themselves on all of these diversity awards that they're receiving, and yet when you look at the people in the positions of power, not just there, right? You look at the people below them, you see that there isn't enough of a racial um, mixture. There isn't enough um, folks who are black or brown in these spaces to create this perception that there is racial equity. Now, if you look at law firms in particular, there's a significant number of Asian associates, right? And oftentimes the diversity store, uh, scorecards that are used will play on the fact that, well, we're so diverse because we have this large Asian population. That is why I need to always be very particular when we're talking about diversity, that we need to define diversity. So you can have a diversity and inclusion minor. That's what it is. You know, that's something that students and uh, organizations will recognize. And, you know, I'm not saying quit it. Don't use that. You absolutely should use diversity and inclusion because right away we know what we're trying to talk about. Right. If you just say racial equity in, in the title of your minor, most people are going to be like, wait, what? Racial equity? What about gender? What about LGBTQ? What about, but, you know, so there's all these other identifying markers that could be used to um, to really uh, identify who is a diverse person. We all know everyone is diverse. That's the problem, <laughs> right? Just like intersection, everybody has an intersectional identity. That's the problem. People are using these terms in the wrong way. If you de define how you're using diversity, if you define how you're um, using inclusion, I think that it's uh, it's appropriate to use. The problem is, it's a catchphrase right now and a buzzword because everyone is talking about it like it just started. It didn't just start. They were trying to push diversity and inclusion in the 80s, in the late 70s, right? But it's so long for very small steps, for us to move very small steps. And now there's, you know, you can, you can, um, you can buy, you can sell this diversity and inclusion uh, terminology. So it's become very popular. Um, you can use it as long as you're using it in the way that it's meant to be used to create equity for various groups, but in particular, for me, I'm looking at racial and gender equity, because there's no other way of, of, because if you look at just LGBT, white men are, you know, they're gay white men, and that becomes um, kind of clouded when we're talking about that, just like the, um, the Paul Weiss, uh, the Paul Weiss announcement, they were able to say that they were diverse because you had someone who was LGBTQ, because you had a white Latino, right? That is problematic to me. You cannot say that you are diverse when every single person I see is white, right? And it's based on perception. So that is not a, a good way of talking about race um, or gender equity. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Diversity, inclusion, and equity. <laughs> um, that's easy to add on to the to the end of that if if we came around to changing, but that's a lot of bureaucracy to change a name around here. Um, my sister uh, Jess Dawson asks, uh, Major Jess Dawson asks, how um, you, as you can see, a lot of these questions are very applied, and we think in terms of application in military sociology a lot. She wants to know how how do we reduce the the inclusion tax? How would you go about reducing that tax how you would reduce that tax by acknowledging that women and people of color have additional work that they need to do just to be in this space um that's the most important way of acknowledging of, of reducing the tax actually saying we understand that women who come in and try to the rank of partner are going to face outside uh, pressures and pressures within the firm that their male counterparts do not. So, for example, women who decide they want to get married and have children, right? So <laughs> you can't be at work. 
for six or you know three, four, five, six months, that time loss is a negative impact towards this woman's career trajectory. The firm should be able to acknowledge that as a person, as a woman, this candidate, this associate is going to have to do um, certain things that is not going to be impacted by or a white male or any male will be impacted in the same way. So what can I do to mitigate that so that it's not disadvantageous for their ability to advance? This is something that firms and other organizations need to be strategic and proactive about targeting in order to reduce that inclusion tax. Um, another example would be, why are we forcing women to conform to particular beauty standards, right? For example, I've been doing uh, some uh, interviews and podcasts where it's a Zoom presentation, and a lot of the men that I've been in conversation with are not shaven, right? It's like people have stopped doing their grooming. Men have particularly stopped doing their grooming. However, if a woman were to come on without makeup, without her hair done, immediately there is this perception that she's not serious, that she's not doing what she needs to do. Um, there, so there are various things uh, that can be done to try to uh, uh, decrease the inclusion tax and how impactful it is, particularly if the organizations are aware that this tax exists in various ways for particular people and how they can then, because they're the ones in positions of power, so they can say, well, you know, um, this associate is going on maternity. This should not stop her clock, right? She's been working just as hard as her male counterpart, and so he's having a baby, but he's still there, all right? So he doesn't lose that type of time the way a woman does. So trying to figure out ways to bridge that so that they are unable so that they don't lose um, the credit towards building the relationships in the firm and with clients um, is one way. I had another way that slipped my mind, but um, yeah, let, another, another way. Yeah, uh -huh. let, let's, get, let's get one more question in and, um, and then we can, and the sort of classic question, uh, that's kind of always a jugular question. I, asked by number 47 here, who I think is uh, my colleague George Kafas at, at the Hellenic Military Academy in Greece. And George wants to know, um, do you think that this phenomenon you have described is only because of a Eurocentric cultural culture domination in the United States? In other words, is this unique to Western, uh, Western US culture? No, I don't. Um, when it comes to <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, quick answer. No, but when it comes to you know uh, Eurocentric beauty standards, no, I mean we we I could also say white corporate aesthetics, right? Um, but the idea that uh, folks conform to what is seen as an ideal, which is white, because that's how we've been culturally programmed um, historically trained to think, right? We buy into that white racial frame and people of color do that all the time. Um, I, I think that in Europe, you still have women, uh, whether they are women of color, because there are women of color in Europe as well, who have to conform to particular uh, white standards. You can just take European out and say white. That standard. And then you have women as a whole in general, white women who have to conform to beauty standard, which it forces them to have to wear makeup, to, you know, spend billions of dollars annually on hair, on makeup, and different grooming practices that they need to maintain in order to be seen uh, in, a, in a more positive way in professional organizations and in social spaces as well. So I do not think that it's a European phenomenon. I think that it goes across the a dominant white perspective. Now, in, I'm Ethiopian born, right? It's beautiful, right? So for us, the way I grew up in my home, in our household in the United States is that, you know, there's nothing more beautiful than an Ethiopian person, right? So there's a sense of, uh, of, uh, of a Eurocentric pride that goes into being black and being, being different, right? And if you look at the, uh, I think you said Bruce Keith is in Ethiopia? right now. But if you yeah. look at the spectrum of, of Ethiopian people, we range in different um, uh, phenotypes, hair types, uh, uh, facial structures. We range. And for us, 
all of it is beautiful. I didn't, I never felt like I wasn't beautiful because I wasn't a light skinned person or because I wasn't white or because I don't, I don't have straight hair, you know, I have very curly hair and I love it. But it's also because in the household I was raised in, because my parents were raised in Ethiopia, the ideals that they had was that we are beautiful. So they didn't have this like constant racialized sense of blackness is not beautiful and being different is not beautiful. Coming here, they even still that in us. It doesn't mean that I don't see it and that I don't encounter it and that I don't also have to fight against what that may look like in friends and myself and people around me, you know. Um, but the idea that white and light is better is a, it's not just an American phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. Okay, terrific. Great. Um, I want to um, I want to stop there uh, and say thank you. Um, to Dr. Mel Malaku for, for her presentation. I want to give uh, Colonel Spain kind of a, a, an opportunity to, to share some last words. He's the um, department head for the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership. Colonel Spain, you still there? Hey, thanks, Dr. Ender. And uh, wow, what a what a meaningful what a meaningful afternoon and and ceremony. It's a uh, my pleasure to be able to offer a few closing comments. And first of all, thanks to Dr. Malaku for joining us from New York City. We all uh, hope you and your family are safe and well. Uh, thank you so much for your thoughtful words about systemic racism and sexism and asking important questions about popular, popular, view, popular views of success and competence, frankly. You know, I'm still thinking about the question. So how do we get somebody to listen? And that makes me think, how can I better listen? I'm still thinking about the question of the inclusion tax, the relational financial time requirements. And I'm thinking about how, how can I acknowledge this tax as a first step to making it less of a reality for my teammates? Thank you for encouraging us to engage in uncomfortable conversations about race and gender to make, frankly, our world a better place. And I'm very grateful for you. Dr. Ender, thanks for the uh, update of the wonderful sociology program and the and the DISM minor of uh, just wow how inspiring that is to and it's been fun to be along and, and watch that journey and be a small part of it with you and the team major apodaca major absalon major jess dawson teammates thanks for your leadership of the sociology major and the DISM and akd it's great to see some other teammates on the line i heard a few of them uh, david fry and Captain Matt Campbell, who Matt Campbell's a war hero, by the way. You should ask him his story sometime. He probably won't tell you, but pin him down and make and make him because it's compelling. You're we, we're in the presence of a war hero right here, team. Uh, Matt Campbell in history. But thank you guys for coming up and being part of a uh, leading our academy and the DISM minor. Dr. Tony McGowan, also a co-sponsor of the DISM minor from Department of English and Philosophy, joining us. Thank you for your leadership as well. I heard Professor jo George Kaufus from the Hellenic Military Academy in Greece. It's a, it's a global effort what we're doing here to treat everyone as they deserve and fully include include, us, include everyone to their, you know, as we should. Dr. Bruce Keith, Professor Emeritus, thank you for joining us from Africa, from your contributions to the Army Sociology Program through the years. Um, we, we're deeply inde indebted to you and very proud of you. And uh, <clears throat> hey, let's focus on congratulations for a second, just close this out to our inductees into AKD. First of all, our CALS class of 2021. Alex, congratulations. Claire, congratulations. Emerson, congratulations. Brandy, congratulations. Stephanie, congratulations. Raven, congratulations. Olivia, congratulations. Our firsties, class of 2020. With vision we lead. That's a cool motto you guys got. Uh, Andrea, congratulations. Coy, congratulations. Miranda, congratulations. We're very, very proud of you. Our faculty member, uh, Brian, congratulations. Thanks for setting the example. We're proud of you as well. It's especially neat to see, you know, seven members of the DISM today uh, in inducted into AKD and think about how the DISM started, you know, with the great, great minds of Morton Ender, Tony um, uh, McGowan and, and Dr. Uh, David Fry here on the line today. And now it's a reality. It's, 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 it's already, it's flourishing now. And it's so neat to see seven members of those team of the team uh, being inducted today and three or four of them graduating and just a, it's a it's it's awesome i'm just deeply proud of it and to be around you today you know when i was a kid at team I, I chose to be an environmental engineer major when it was new no one had ever done it before it was brand new at west point and the reason i wanted to do it is because i wanted to help other people 
That's the sole reason I want to do it. I thought maybe I, there's something I could do to help other people. There wasn't a uh, there wasn't a dis major at the time because I sure would have loved to have done that. But I did what you did, and that is you want to help people, and that's why you picked majors like sociology, and that's why you picked major, excuse me, minors like the DISM, because you care deeply about others, and you care deeply about a world where there's there's fairness and just and right, and I'm very proud of you for that, and uh, I feel like in, in good company here. So, hey, you're joining a great legacy in this honor society. Alpha Kappa Delta is 100 years old this year. West Point's chapter of Alpha Five New York is 20 years old. Great Great, great timing to join. Uh, very, very special years. As Dr. Enders said earlier, there's 113 sociology majors at West Point. And, and most of you know this, but our guest speaker might not. West Point's the only academy with a sociology major, and we're deeply proud of that. And it's, now we have the largest numbers in our history, the strongest program we've ever had. And it's due to a lot of the leadership and the cadets in this room that have done that, or in this virtual room. So team, I wanted to just leave you with a charge to our to our new inductees, and that is, think a second about what this is. It's, it's a recognition of your excellent past performance in, in your scholarship, but it's also a commissioning to take forward what you have learned and go do good in the world. So I'd like you to just think, this is our, how many inductees do we have? About, counting them here, about 11? 11. About 11, okay. So to, this is to the 11 inductees, and the rest of us will be witnesses of this for you. Um, I ask you right now to, Think of this as a commission to go take what you've learned and work together and do good in the world. So I'd like for you right now to think of something big that you're going to accomplish for others over the next 20 years. You're going to do a lot, but pick one thing that's a stretch goal. Keep in your mind about what you're going to do for others of the, all the things you've learned in the next 20 years. Keep it in your mind for a second. I'll give you about 10 seconds to think of that huge task. What is it? Well, because I know you've been thinking about it before frankly. OK, so I'm going to give you two charges here. First is don't let anything stop you. Don't let anything stop you. And the second thing is take care of others along the way. Take care of others along the way. Congratulations again. We're very, very proud of you. Well done and go Army. Dr. Ender. Awesome. Thank you, Colonel Spain. Uh, wise words, um, sage advice, uh, terrific. Uh, okay, so th that is the, we'll let that conclude our 2020 Alpha Kappa Delta Induction Society um, ceremony. I will stay on the line if anybody wants to uh, chat. Thanks everybody from coming from literally, looks like almost all over the planet, um, as well as, uh, across the table from me here. So uh, great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much, Professor Milaku. This was an incredible presentation. Oh, thank, thank you. I'm, I'm glad, you know, folks uh, were able to think about this stuff and are interested. Please feel free, feel free to reach out to me, too. I, I love having conversations with folks and seeing where they are with their thoughts. Assuming we're done with social distancing in the fall, I definitely would like you to come back and